Hello everyone, welcome to this Project Earth interview with amazing Jenny from Community Carbon Trees in Costa Rica. We are so grateful for you having us here and it's amazing and honor to meet you. So Jenny, maybe we would like to start a little bit more personal about you. Who are you and what would you say is your personal purpose in life? Oh, thank you so much, Lila and, and Gaia TV. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I'm Tree Jenny, and the kids gave me that name from a project. We do Kids Nature Days that go with our organization, Community Carbon Trees. And my purpose in life is to get as many people involved in reforesting the equator with long-term, biodiverse, fair pay, rainforest trees as possible. So our organization is unique because we create a way for you to sponsor trees, to use your own gifts, your own work to give back to Pachamama, to Gaia, and to do that in a place that you know is fair, you know is paying the workers, including men and women, and planting these trees on their own farms. So we're not using your money to buy land, and we're not doing any kind of volunteer tree planting. We really believe in creating long-term livelihoods so that the trees we plant now grow into a new forest and the people participating with this turn into guardians of that new forest through this having a job concept. Wow, this is really innovative and super magical. I'm curious, um, what is your position in the organization and what is your usual work? So I'm the founder of this organization. I moved to Costa Rica 21 years ago, Lila. I came here as a young lawyer, very disgusted with uh, the work I was doing in Louisiana. Um, I practiced there for eight years and just did not feel that I was following my destiny of being a, a warrior for Mother Earth. And um, I've always had a green thumb. And so I came here on a vacation and was offered a job and uh, was working to educate communities about biological corridors. And through that work, I started learning why people cut the rainforest down what poverty is doing to drive cutting the rainforest down, how we're colonial settling the world and failing to recognize the rights and the fairness of the local people. So I started a tree planting business here and through that process realized that we needed to be doing the same work with the local people. So 11 years ago, natural step was to create the nonprofit. So I founded this nonprofit based on everything I had learned the prior 10 years of both doing rainforest conservation work here as a lawyer, being in these communities and meeting the families and understanding what are the obstacles? Why aren't, why don't they plant trees? and creating a solution, these jobs, to solve that problem. And so being the founder, you know, I, I drive this train and it is a train, you know, people jump on, people jump off. And we love that, you know, we love to have people involved. And it's, um, it's a big job running this organization, but I feel that all of my skills really come to play and my typical day is is so balanced and varied uh, while I probably work harder than anyone I know uh, and have for these 21 years. Um, 
it is a balanced lifestyle. For example, yesterday, you know, I got up early, I did my yoga, um, I worked for three hours or so, sending out content to some different people, uh, sending the monthly bank statements to the accountant, looking at all of that, uh, receiving messages from my workers, getting together how much payday was for them for the end of the month, transferring that money, uh, had an interview with a guy on Instagram Live for an hour, um, ate lunch. Sometimes I don't even eat lunch, <laughs> which isn't good. I don't recommend that as an activist. You've got to take care of yourself. And then I went seed collecting because, you know, for me, getting out in the soil, staying connected with Mama Earth, you know, what's inspiring me to do this keeps me doing some of the parts that aren't so fun, you know? So I did go seed collecting and I got about uh, 50 breadfruit trees and shared those stories on Instagram. And, you know, every day is a little different. Some days I'm out in the field with the workers supervising them. I am actually putting some trees in the ground. Sometimes I'm in the nursery with a group. Sometimes I am writing articles or reaching out for funding. Um, certainly, you know, I get a lot of emails and messages, so being timely with replies. Um, it's a lot of fun. I love that it, it's varied and um, any given day is going to be different. I also have to stay flexible because I never know, you know, maybe I need to switch gears and do that. So I think that's also important as someone running an organization to recognize um, you got to stay really flexible and you've got to wear many hats, right? And, uh, and know what your weaknesses are and being able to ask for help for the things that you're not so good at. I think that's been really important to me in running and driving this train. If, if I don't know how to fix the engine, well, I need to have someone who can help me do that. So um, there's a lot of that that goes on in my head of a very um, serious prioritization of my time. Like, is this something I need to be doing? Or is that better for me to farm out to someone else and let them do that because they're gonna do a better job of it than I am? Or is this something I need to do? I need to look at that accounting every month. I, I need to make sure that's straight and clear every month. My accountants do all the nitty gritty spreadsheet because I'm not good at that, but I need to make sure, you know, that I'm looking at that and staying on top of it. So I think that there's a lot of uh, prioritization that goes on in, in my world for sure. Yes, uh, busy woman, busy woman, I would say. So, Jenny, when yeah. you started the organization 21 years ago, really the year that I was born, it's such a long time already, what was your long-term goal, your future vision? You know, I always have held a goal of growing one million trees. Um, I don't think it matters so much about the numbers. I think it also matters about the inspiration we're putting out there. So as time has gone, I've realized um, it's about growing the forest, not how many trees we plant, but how many we really grow and how many farmers we work with and how biodiverse these food forests are. So how many different species can we plant together? How many rivers can we cover? How many water springs can we cover? How many people can I have access to, to inspire them that no action is too small? Every tree makes a difference. Every 
um, share on Instagram or every person watching this video who might get inspired to sponsor even one tree or reach out and say, hey, we can help you with that marketing or video or hey, I want to help you reach out to those corporations. There's, there's no gift too small. And so as time has gone on, I've moved away from being so focused on the one million tree goal and switching the focus more to how can I hold space for all these other people to participate so they can feel good about doing something for future generations, about doing something for climate change, about not feeling guilty about um, being abundant in what we have, just recognizing, oh, I can give back. Oh, I bought, you know, a $200 purse today. Hmm, maybe, maybe Mama Earth wants a tree and I can do that. And I know if I do that with this organization, these people are going to get paid and it's going to be fair. So, um, that's been a huge inspiration for me. And from the very beginning, I always felt I was anxious about climate change. As a young woman your age, when I was 21, that was, uh, wow, that was 32 years ago. I'm 52 years old. So I was anxious about climate change I woke up to climate change at around 10 years old and I was anxious and that's why I became a lawyer. I thought being a lawyer was going to be my way to serve the planet. And it has been, those skills are critical for what I'm doing now. But I felt like if I'm anxious about this, I know other people are too. I'm not anxious anymore. When I go to sleep at night, I'm like, you're doing everything you can, Jenny. And that's peace. And I think other people want to feel that as well. Like, okay, I'm doing something. It's real. I trust this organization. I, I understand now that planting trees on the equator is really the strong, powerful solution for Gaia. So I wanted to give that opportunity to other people. Wow, and you definitely are. I'm very, very excited to hear more about what is your current focus and what are specific projects that you're working on? So our current focus, uh, it's rainy season in Costa Rica. So every year we... Um, not only plant trees, but we maintain all the trees we plant. So we do that for a total of four years. It's about 14 to 15 literal human choppings over those four years during rainy season for every tree that's sponsored. It's absolutely necessary for the trees to grow. If we don't go back to the trees, the cattle grasses, they just strangle them, the vines, the regenerating vegetation that comes back just strangles the trees. So our focus always, first and foremost, is growing the trees, and that's work. Um, I have wonderful crews. They've been trained. They've been with me a long time. They get paid by the hour. There's accountability. We count the trees, and this time of year, the grass is growing, so we're out there chopping. So that's always a focus, is making sure the trees grow. Uh, rainy season is generally, we're in the fields generally from May till huh, now with climate change, it's raining sometimes all the way through December. So we're sometimes even in the field in January now, which is new. We used to be done by November, but we've had to add a chopping now because it's raining off season. Okay, fine. You know, it's called mitigation. Things are changing, we adapt. So taking care of the trees, um, also seed collecting, just 
making sure that we are keeping our nurseries full, that we're getting all the seeds that are falling now, because during January, February, March, that's kind of down season for field work. We're not shopping and we're not really collecting seeds. We're watering the nursery because it's dry. So I have to know that during that season, that's when I'm a lot more focused on fundraising, uh, reaching out, also maybe just taking a breath for myself. Um, I don't do that a lot and it's important to rest. Um, I don't take off lots of time for sure, but I have learned, especially, you know, with the years invested that a grueling schedule just burns you out. So I recognize that's a good time maybe to go on a yoga retreat or go see my family in Louisiana or go to the beach a little more. Um, do some projects around my house to take care of where I live. So that's back to that prioritization. And, um, you know, we stay focused on expanding always. Just, it never stops walking through the doors that open for us. So whatever door opens, again, I have to be flexible enough to know that's important walk through that door today, even though you've got guys in the field and even though you need to go collect those seeds, I always put a lot of energy on making sure that we're keeping the money coming in so that we can pay our workers. So are you looking for volunteers or even new employees and what is their specific job we love for people to get involved in, in a hands-on way and so we're not a volunteer tree planting organization we, we want and we need to create these jobs because remember if we solve the poverty people stop cutting the rainforest down. In fact, they become forest protectors. And that's how we know that we're changing consciousness in these communities and we're regenerating the souls as we're regenerating the soil and the forest. So um, we do receive volunteer labor, however, in our tree nurseries. People can come to Costa Rica. They can do an immersion program either with one of our Costa Rican families or they have a shipping container here at my farm next to one of the tree nurseries. So it's not super expensive, like all this permaculture programs, you know, um, there is a cost because you're learning a lot and it is a beautiful experience, but our main goal is, is receiving, um, receiving the people who are, who are really, you know, committed to helping us. And so, um, we also do day projects that are volunteer in the tree nursery and those have a very minimal cost because, We've just learned, I've learned how much energy it takes for me to be in there with everyone. It's, it basically takes most of my energy for the day. So again, it's a very minimal cost. And we love the idea that many hands make light work. So there is some hands-on opportunities, some opportunities to go seed collecting with me, go into the forest, commune with the, the grown mama papa trees grandpa trees and collect their babies and transplant those in the tree nursery and also making the compost that we use for the filling the tree bags weeding watering all that's really helpful one of the biggest areas that we need support and creativity and artists would be in marketing and uh taking our content turning it into stories, um, creating graphs. Because we've been around a long time now, we can show our grown forest. 
So it's wonderful if we can do content that has like before and after. And so granted, I have to kind of set that up and pull it together. But once I pull it together, if somebody takes that and then turns it into something uh, eye candy with a story, we love that. That's beautiful and that's helpful. Um, we also need helpful creative souls with reaching out for funding. Again, we can provide pitch decks, we can provide presentations and example letters and um, brochures, photos, what have you, so that you can sit and be a warrior and reach out for funding. And we do pay commissions for that. We really believe in sustainability and win, 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 symbiotic relationships. So if somebody can come up with some funding, we'll give them a dollar a tree. And that adds up because if you at attract a corporation who, who plants, you know, 500 trees a year with one letter, that's 500 bucks. And you're doing something hugely uh, beneficial for the planet. So we want creative types who are like, I want to be a tree sales person, right? You know, we sell everything else. Why not create sales jobs selling trees? So I'm, I'm really into that. Um, and then giving back with your own creations. Let's say you're a musician and you have a new album and you want to give back, you know, 1% to the planet or 0.5% to the planet. And you're like, you know, wow, I made you know, $9,000 last year and I want to give, you know, 1%. Okay. You know, these are beautiful ways that your, your work gives back to Gaia. And again, there's no gift too small. And then for those types of exchanges, we, we give people our logo and we help them tell the story of being a tree ambassador with us and speaking out. Um, if you wanna go to schools and give presentations, we have a beautiful game called the 50 Reasons We Love Rainforest Trees. And we can provide you with that and you can go to schools and um, do fun interactions with kids. Uh, we've got some game playing with children that have been really successful both with school teachers and homeschool parents who use some of our curriculum so we do have a lot of um material to give you and then you can take it and do with it what you want and make it yours you know um i'm pretty good at delegating i it's a lot of it's big, our message, right? So sometimes it takes people a little bit of practice to get their voice ready, to feel confident with the material. And so I'm, I'm very patient to, to walk through that process and help you become an activist. You know, the Lorax is so cool and he inspires all of us to speak for the trees, but I find that sometimes people are a little overwhelmed and they're like, wow, you know, so it's like, how can I help you? Do you want to practice on me? Give your presentation to me and I will, I will criticize you and give you some good feedback and um, and then people are off and running and they have a lot of fun and they tell me, you know, just how full and good they feel after a presentation. And again, they see how hard it is. Honestly, it can be a little um, frustrating sometimes, you know, it's like, wow, I did all that and nobody sponsored a tree. And you're like, oh, welcome to my world. But it's, it's again, it's not all about that, right? It's about the frequency, the, the lifting up and, and getting out there and doing it, you know, being on the path and the journey and less focused on the results, more focused on 
the intention and the heart going in to do it and and holding space for each other as we cheer each other on, right? Beautifully said, really wonderful. So you are looking for donors. For which type of donors are you looking for and what exactly would they donate for? We are looking for tree sponsorships. So again, one tree at a time, every tree makes a difference. So one tree with the four years of labor plus the seed collecting, all of that process is $25. So we use that money to pay the workers. Uh, we even include a six year pruning of the lower branches so that once the canopy closes around five years, we go in, we take off the lower branches and we make sure opening light to keep that forest growing taller and more robust because the amount of carbon dioxide we're going to suck in depends on how big the trees get. So we don't want our trees to stunt at four years. So we've learned through the process that we have to add that cleaning, that ch chainsaw work at year six. So the $25 covers all of that. And one tree is awesome. A thousand trees is awesome. However many trees is awesome. And we work with Global Giving, which is available for anyone who wants a tax deduction in the USA. So they are on our website on a button that says Global Giving, US Tax Deduction. We also work with a group called Giving Way, and they're a really neat platform that helps us with newsletters and some marketing. We like them a lot. And um, right now we're reworking our website to do a new payment funnel. We used to work with PayPal, but PayPal was a, uh, had some issues in Costa Rica and we had a big, you know, this is part of like reality 101 of running a nonprofit. Um, sometimes things are going to go wrong. And we had an issue with PayPal at the beginning of COVID and they shut our account and they held our money. They're still holding our money. Uh, it was very stressful for me. I was completely disgusted with the way their customer service treated us. Um, we're done with the issue now, but we're not gonna work with PayPal anymore. So I'm just not gonna, my integrity is important and I'm not going to be treated by a company the way they treated us. So we found another group and we're in the process of reworking our website, but that's not up yet. So I think it's gonna take a couple months. So between now, and let's say November 1st, we ask you to use Global Giving or Giving Way. And those are on our current website. And then we're just doing an upgrade. You know, I can say when, when things go wrong, you have to take that as a learning experience and figure out how can I use this as an opportunity? What is this showing me? Um, what did I do wrong? or what weakness do I have here? And we, we had a weakness with PayPal. And so now we're fixing that weakness and excited to upgrade our website and make it uh, new and more uh, fresh and streamlined. And uh, yeah, it's time. So again, don't be afraid of making mistakes and taking those mistakes as learning lessons. and Again, uh, every tree makes a difference. So sponsoring trees is, uh, is absolutely really our number one focus. That's mostly what we want from you. And I've learned over the years, freedom to ask, sponsor a tree. That's what we want you to do. Yes, we want all the other, but in addition, we, we need you to sponsor a tree. Thank you. Yes, that's a 
definitely a big challenge already. But apart from that, what would you say is another bigger challenge for your organization in general? I think one of our biggest challenges is getting out into the social network world and lifting the other tree planting groups away from free and cheap trees. It's a huge problem in our industry. There are no regulations. So a lot of tree planting groups have taken advantage of the beauty and generosity of trees and people just sort of bite that apple without asking any questions. And it's, it's, it's creating slavery for poor people in the third and developing world. So for example, you know, buy a hat and plant 10 trees and they're like, yeah, we plant that tree for 10 cents. I'm like, you're making me wanna throw up. Why in the world do you think that's good? And you see corporate support. Oh, you know, this company, just planted 289,000 trees with $2,800. I'm like, no way. I don't believe it. I'm gonna shake my finger and say, I know too much. I have experience and there's no way. There's no way. And a lot of these groups are new, so they can't show you their grown forest. They can't show you the people working. They're sure as hell not going to interview those people and go, yeah, how do you feel about this? And then they say, oh, but planting trees is so wonderful. How dare you criticize what I'm doing? And I'm like, because I believe part of the reason I'm here is to lift the bar and say we have to do this right. We, it's just like having women sit in a sweatshop making, you know, dollar t-shirts that can be sold at Zara for $40. Who makes your clothes? Who plants your trees? It's all the same issue. And by supporting those organizations and acting like we're doing a good thing with cheap trees, we are literally ensuring poverty. And like I said at the beginning, poverty drives deforestation, cutting down trees. When people don't have money, they're gonna cut it down and sell the tree on the black market, or they're gonna cut it down for some corporation that comes in and takes advantage of vulnerable people and gets them to plant monocultures of African oil palm or pineapples or cacao, these world products, commodities that are in high demand. And um, beyond the fact that it's not helping the earth, it's not fair. That's called climate justice, climate rights. With everything going on right now with Black Lives Matter, with talking about white privilege. This is exactly what I've been yelling about for 20 years. Basically, we have to pay the tree planters a living wage. This is hard work. And if you don't go back and take care of the trees, they're not gonna grow. So how do you think you're gonna do that with 10 cents? I don't care if it's an economy of scale, which means, you know, the more, the bigger the project is, the price goes down. To a degree, that's true. But with tree planting, it's not so true. Because if I have to do 15 choppings for every tree, the labor is also going up by the number of trees. So is the supervision, so is the overhead of accounting. The inspiration of the communities, the number of 
farmers involved, which requires more people to manage it. And believe me, they're not going to work for $600 a month the way I do. So if we're going to scale and get bigger, we can't drop the price of the tree because we're going to need more people, which is a good thing, right? So that is the biggest challenge I have right now, Lila. And honestly, I try not to go and call out any specific groups. More what I try to do is educate people like you listening to this. Like, these are the kinds of questions you need to ask when you're considering where to plant your trees. If you're like, yeah, I, I developed this awesome thing and I'm making tons of money and I'm going to go work with X group and they tell me, yeah, you can plant a thousand trees with a hundred bucks. I'm going to go, no, no, better to plant fewer trees and know those trees are going to live, know they're growing into a forest that's going to create wildlife corridors and know that they're paying local people to lift out of poverty, to keep their land, to stop this colonization of the world by the big corporations buying up all the land and stop what I would definitely call modern day slavery, tree slavery, so that people can go, yeah, I'm planting trees and they're 10 cents each. I had this conversation on a post last night and I was flabbergasted that they were proud of the fact that the trees cost 10 cents. I was like, go to bed, Jenny, get some rest. Tomorrow's a new day. Yes, tomorrow's a new day. And uh, especially in the future, I think that a lot of people are awakening to those type of situations and challenges. So from your point of view, what would be a solution such as like a certification process or an educational process or what would be the solution in order to yeah, um, create more awareness around different tree planting companies and their prices? I love that question. It's a very uh, intelligent question. Thank you, Lila. Um, exactly. I, I think the carbon certification process is, is also part of the problem. So it's not about certifying carbon dioxide because those are only available to really big organizations because they're very expensive. So um, I do think International laws are important, policy that require a minimal fair pay based on the monetary system and the culture of each country in the developing world. So for example, you know, the living wage in India is way less than the living wage in Costa Rica. Um, maybe the living wage in India needs to go up. So this is a huge, <laughs> huge piece of our world governance. And um, there's so much money to be made in these carbon offsets that there's not a lot of inspiration to pass these laws. And I'm, I'm just not even sure in my lifetime that will happen. I hope so. I hold space for it. I'd love to be sitting at that table. I'm qualified to as a lawyer and someone in the industry. And because I consult with groups from India and Haiti and the Philippines who want to do it the way we're doing it with a real fair pay per hour. And for example, our workers still only make $45 a day. It's not a ton of work, but that's fair pay. It's actually a little higher than what is fair pay in Costa Rica. Plus, they have insurance. Plus, we pay Costa Rican taxes. So we're supporting the local economy. I think policy is one way at it. And I also think exactly what you're doing right now. Education, I think 
power to the people. Boycott is so powerful. We vote every day with how we spend our money. If we would quit supporting those Dollar Tree setups, they would not be so strong. Why do they have 100,000 followers when we have seven? You know, we have to vote with our money. We have to vote with our action. We have to vote with our boycott. So I think education of the masses, I think people waking up to social justice, climate justice, inclusion, privilege. I think all of this is part of it. And if people would just vote with their dollars, if we had more sponsors, we could replicate more. We could get bigger. We could expand. We could actually even replicate and go help other groups in other countries. And we've already done that. So we work in Kenya and that happened with private wealth. Someone found us and said, we want to help you move into Kenya. So we're doing that. We went to Kenya. We work at a distance with them now. We hope to go back next year. We were supposed to go this November, but with COVID we can't. That's fine. In fact, our leader in Kenya is recovering from COVID unbelievable the situation in nairobi is bad um so we've also replicated with a group in india that has just grown huge because they have their own funding in their own country so again i think replicating a model like ours even though it maybe doesn't have our name on it again that's I'm inspired to do that. And I spend a lot of time consulting with small groups. I teach every year at the Yale Tropical Forestry Conference and I need a lot of small groups. We've basically reduced our model into some manuals. They're, they're not 100% finished. They're not slick and finished yet, but they're, they're ready enough to share with groups. And we do because often these groups in their own countries can get grant money from the United Nations or from some contact that they have. And we, we take nothing from that. I, I am about open source the model. And so again, I think money talks, the stronger we are, the more encouraged I am, the more able I am to focus on sitting down and helping these other groups replicate, take our idea, take our grant application, literally cut and paste, and maybe even they have enough money to pay me and my team to get on an airplane, go to their community, spend a week there, get them running, help supervise them a little for them to basically do the same thing where they live. So I think it's more about grassroots than government control because I think the government hands put into this tree planting thing is because it's, there's a lot of money involved. People are giving money for it to the wrong places in my opinion. Um, and I think that we have to take our power back in every way right now, in every sphere. We have to remember, it's like uh, Bob Marley said, you know, uh, when the people remember, they have the power. We have to remember, we have the power to participate or not participate. And I think that's our greatest tool right now is to remind each other, you're voting with what you do, with your money, what you consume, who you support. Yes, I totally agree. And I also think that, yeah, like money is something, it's like an exchange model that is out there. So sometimes I also have this perception that if people would have this feeling of, okay, if money wouldn't be a problem anymore for, for you, like if you had all the money of the world, 
then let's focus on the solution. Which problem would you like to solve? That's exactly the problem I'm working on is let's reforest the equator. It is our biggest, most powerful regenerative tool for global climate cycles. Our website has a whole section on that and you can go read about it. Um, we have videos on our YouTube channel. One is called Tree Huggers and it talks about the rain cycle, the cloud cycle, the water cycle, which we cannot live without. So um, with unlimited money, I would do exactly what I'm doing and I would replicate to every little country around the equator I could. Um, empowering the local people to manage themselves, to own the solution grassroots, to communicate with their neighbors and reestablish that sense of symbiosis. What happens on your land affects me and vice versa. What happens on the equipment affects you wherever you live. So I would do everything I'm already doing. I just uh, would be doing more of it, right? And I'd be sharing that money, you know, because it would be getting paid out to the tree planters. So money doesn't inspire me personally. I would have stayed a lawyer if, if I wanted to make a bunch of money in life. Um, I'm happy eating my beans and rice and picking my pineapple out of my garden and going to the thrift store for my clothing and, you know, having my basic needs met. I'm very, very grateful that I don't have to worry about that, but I have contact with so many people who, who do um, struggle. And when your children are hungry or somebody needs medicine, or your truck needs tires, or you don't even have a truck, let's say. <laughs> Forget about having a truck. You know, those people will do whatever's necessary to feed their family. And if that means going down and cutting down the rainforest and putting more cows on their land, they're gonna do it. So money is a tool. Money is not the root of evil. It's the way money is used that is the root. Money is a tool. I wanna to have a good relationship with money. I believe that money has a beautiful positive frequency when used in that way. So I don't think money is the enemy. I do believe in barter cultures and I do believe in that, but you can't ask poor people to get paid with pineapples. That's white supremacy. That's privilege. They need money. They, we've all had the ability to have money. I'm sitting on a nice computer. Don't pay me in pineapples, please. Don't tell me you're going to give me this tree and I'm going to get paid by picking the oranges off the tree six years from now. Spare me, please. You know, that, that again, uh, not the solution. So... Yeah, show me the money. <laughs> amazing, amazing. So is there any organization or specific project that you can recommend or perhaps an organization that you're collaborating with already? So we are collaborating with the Maasai Center for Regenerative Agriculture in Kenya. They are doing wonderful work. Uh, educating the, the Africans living in that eastern section of Kenya about grazing the animals more properly. They're a beautiful organization doing really big work and it's incredibly important because you may not know this, but the Sahara Desert is eating the last of the green belt in Africa. And so that means the elephants, the rhinos, the giraffes, I saw very few when I was there. They are suffering from terrible, terrible drought. So working in Africa is incredibly important. I also really love Amazon Watch, who is working in the Amazon with indigenous people to um, help address 
the problems we're having in the Amazon. Now, with all the fires last year, there's going to be a lot of these cheap tree projects in the Amazon. They're already happening and they're creating problems. So I think, again, supporting the right organizations who are spending your money in ways that are really going to help the local people on the ground, not the corporation coming in not the big conservation group, but the local people on the ground. And so those two organizations I have direct links to, and I believe in them. I also believe in Protect Our Winters in the USA, which is working on policy for climate change. Uh, Jeremy Jones invented snowboarding and he has supported our organization with donations for the last six years. So that organization is appearing before Congress and is lobbying to work with the USA to have better participation in climate change global legislation when we've lost a lot of ground on that in the last four years. So um, we also need to keep lobbying policy change. So I really love Protect Our Winters and I know that there's integrity in the way that that organization is run. So those would be three recommendations around the world, depending on what you're interested in. And of course, you know, community carbon trees, sponsor a tree. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, it's simply magical to see how many solutions are there outside in the world and just uh, waiting to be discovered. So I'm hopeful. I always love ending our conversations with one question that is, if you had one message to the world, what would it be? What we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. We are absolutely intertwined. There's no planet B. Mars is not the earth and we're not ready for Mars. And I don't want to live on Mars. Not when I get recycled and come back and another person, you know, if you believe in that or doesn't matter. But what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. And that's why, again, that giving back, even one tree makes a difference. You're going to feel good from it. And, you know, turning off the lights, uh, turning off the tap when you wash your hair, uh, not dumping pollutants everywhere, you know, herbicides and pesticides, choosing where your food comes from, acting locally, seeking out local farmers markets, seeking out local craftsmen, paying attention to the products you buy, how much packaging is there, where did it come from, how many miles of transportation does it have on it? Are you trying to eat a strawberry in uh, off season that had to come from some other place? Are you eating avocados from Chile and not realizing that that avocado spit out a ton of CO2? Um, reusable bags. What are you doing with those masks? You know, do you have a reusable one you're washing out? Um, what are you eating? Where is it coming from? I'm not a militant vegan, but I do, I, but I am a vegan, but I'm not into judgment and guilt. I'm into ask questions. So if you're going to eat meat let's say your organism needs meat so seek out a small holistic grazer for your beautiful happy meat it costs a little more so again that's privilege thinking about all the people who can't do that who have no choice but to eat those hot dogs bless their hearts right we gotta quit being so judgmental of our brothers and sisters and know that we're all on different stages of this journey. So if we're feeling like we're, we're in a good place, then I think we're obligated to give back and, and get out there and kiss the earth, you know? Love it. Give her your love. Father Sky, Mama Earth, send out your frequency of love and gratitude. 
because yeah what we do to the earth we're doing to ourselves thank you very much for this beautiful words and for everything you do you are really a gift to the world and i'm very very excited to see where this um, conversation and the collaboration guides us in the future and thank you so much for your precious time it was a real pleasure and honor to spend these amazing insights with you and yeah thank you so much sending much love to costa rica and hope to see you soon hey pura vida thank you laila thank you everyone we love trees mm -hmm.